And while it was still dark, Mary found the light. The disciples came running, but they did not understand. Mary stood weeping and saw angels, but did not recognize Jesus. But when Jesus calls our name, then we recognize the way, the truth, and the life. And then there was feasting, and there is feasting to come. God will make for all peoples a feast of rich food and well-aged wines, and will wipe away tears from all faces. It will be said on that day, this is our God for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice. There is peace by Jesus Christ. Hold firmly to the good news which you received, in which you stand, through which you are being saved. Let's open the gates of righteousness to enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
We serve a God for whom death is never the last word. A God who, through Jesus, chose to live among us, to experience life's joys and life's suffering, who walked through death and who offered and continues to offer healing, forgiveness, freedom, and abundant life. We serve a God of resurrection who renews our hope, love, and purpose this day and every day. Indeed, Christ is alive and goes before us to show and share what love can do. Please pray with me. As we celebrate Christ's resurrection today, O oh God, we offer praise and gratitude for your love and grace. May they empower and renew us as vessels of your hope, grace, mercy, power, and love in our world as we seek to walk with you each day. In the name of the risen Christ, amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. We will have breakout groups to share together.
What is that? Deep calls to deep. We give thanks from the depths of our hearts. Once weeping, now proclaiming, I have seen the Lord. Once famished, now feasting. This is the God for whom we have waited. Once divided, now convicted, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. We shall not die, but we shall live and keep telling the deeds of the Lord. Deep calls to deep. You call to us from the depth of your love, O God. You have come to us in Jesus Christ. We, we answer, answer your, your call, call to deep, deep living. living. Children come to me. Let the children come. Never hinder, never stop them. Oh, let the children come. Let the children come to me. Let the children come. Never hinder, never stop them. Oh, let the I'm Janet, and Phil is our cameraman today, and happy Easter. Good morning, everybody. It is great to have you with us. I'm Janet, and Phil is our cameraman today, and happy Easter. We're glad to have you here. The offering for today, for the children's offering, goes to the Crisis Nursery. And this is a place that helps families when they're having trouble. And it creates a safe place for children and parents to come and, and receive care and love. Well, today is Easter when we celebrate that Jesus is still alive in spirit with us, even though he suffered and died 2000 years ago. After Jesus took his last breath and died, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, asked Pilate if he could take the body and give it a, a proper burial. Pilate gave him permission. So he and a friend took the body of Jesus down from the cross and wrapped it with spices and perfume in linen cloths, according to their burial customs. There was a garden nearby with a new tomb that had not been used, and they lovingly laid the body of Jesus there in the tomb. They rolled a heavy stone in front of the tomb and sealed it and paid a guard to watch the tomb. The next day, Saturday, like yesterday, was the Jewish Sabbath, so they were not allowed to go visit the tomb that day. They must have spent the day grieving crying and wondering what they would do next without Jesus. That brings us today, Easter morning. So that Sunday, the day after Sabbath, very, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus' close friend, Mary Magdalene, followed the path to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been rolled away. She gasped and ran back as fast as she could to tell the others. They have taken our Lord Jesus out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Some of them didn't believe her. They said, you're seeing things. But Peter and the other disciple ran to the tomb with her. They saw too that the tomb, the stone of the tomb was rolled away. And they went into the tomb. They saw the linen wrappings lying there 
and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head was rolled up in a place by itself. They were astonished and confused. They still did not understand the scripture that Christ would rise from the dead. Confused, they returned to their homes. But Mary, she stayed. She stood there outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she peered into the tomb and she, she saw two angels in white shining, sitting where the body of Jesus had been laying, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Thinking it was just the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried away this body, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary turned and said to him in their native tongue, Rabboni, which means teacher. She wanted to throw her arms around him to hug him and weep with joy. But Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go now to my beloved friends and say to them that I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. So Mary Magdalene ran back again to where the followers of Jesus were gathered. And she announced to the disciples, I, I have seen the Lord. He is risen. And Mary told them everything. This, young friends, is the Easter story. Jesus, their dear friend, died and rose again so that we might understand and receive the love of God and the way of peace. Jesus the Christ is risen. Hallelujah. I am reading from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 to 9. On this mountain, the Lord of heavenly hosts will prepare for all peoples a rich feast, a feast of choice wines, of select foods rich in flavor, of choice wines well refined. He will swallow up on this mountain the veil that is veiling all peoples, the shroud and shrouding all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe tears from every face. He will remove his people's disgrace from off the earth. For the Lord has spoken. They will say on that day, look, this is our God for whom we have waited and he has saved us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited, let's be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And then moving over to the New Testament, John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early in the morning of the first day of the week, while it was still dark, 
Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. He also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. It wasn't with the other clothes, but it was folded up in its own place. Then the other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. <clears throat> Mary stood outside near the tomb, crying. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? She replied, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they put him. As soon as she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. Then she told them what he said to her. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. We worship the God of resurrection. We are a resurrection people. Today's sermon is about what it means to worship the God of resurrection who calls us to become a resurrection people. Let's pray. God of life, as we walk this morning among the gravestones that mark our lives, that name the sadness of loss and the grief of unmet expectations and the pain of dead and buried dreams. Bring us face to face with the risen Christ. O God of life, make us one with the risen Christ. Amen. The sun had not yet risen when Mary made her way to the tomb. It was still dark, says John's gospel. Mark says the sun was already up, and Matthew and Luke say that it happened at dawn, but John is insistent. The night is not yet ended. John began his account all the way back in chapter one by describing Jesus as life itself, the life that is the light of all people, the light that shines in the shadows and the shadows did not overcome it. 
But here we are in chapter 20, and as it opens, the light of life has been wrapped in a shroud of death and hidden away under the earth. No doubt this was what prevented Mary from sleeping, what drove her to the tomb, her grief over the torturous, dehumanizing death that had stolen the life from her dear friend and guide. It was impossible to imagine the world without him. Why should the sun rise without Jesus there to greet it? Why should the spring blossoms bloom or the fresh rain fall or the days lengthen or the warm bread come to life without the light of the world there to bless them? Why, indeed? We don't know much about Mary from Magdala, spotlighted here. John reports that she was among the three Marys who stayed with Jesus at the cross, and Luke counts her among a cohort of women who found hope and power in the Jesus community, but any more detail than that is midrash. The only thing possibly more frightening for Mary than recent events, the events ending with the execution and burial of Jesus, is what Mary found when she arrived at the tomb where he had been buried. It was empty. Someone had taken the body. Apparently it wasn't enough that the body of Christ, the beloved child of God, was suspected and abused, criminalized, arrested, accused, tortured, hung, and brutalized. It wasn't enough that the light of life had been violently snuffed out by the insatiable appetite for control and power that was threatened by a man who resisted that sort of power with every spirit-filled breath. Apparently, it wasn't enough just to kill him. Now they had taken the body. They would erase all memory of his existence. Mary ran to the other disciples, her mind and heart racing the whole way there. When she told them what she saw, they raced to the tomb to see for themselves. The shroud that held the lifeless body of Jesus was still there, but Jesus was not. When they entered the empty tomb, John tells us that Simon Peter and the one called the beloved disciple, quote, saw and believed, though they did not yet understand. Then, John says, Simon Peter and the other disciple returned to their homes. That's verse 10. They returned to their homes. You heard that right. They just up and went away. They just went home. They raced to the tomb, confirmed Mary's eyewitness account of the missing body, and then they left. Truly, they did not yet understand to read on in the next chapter confirms this odd behavior that 21st chapter leaves the scene in Jerusalem entirely and instead returns us all the way back miles away to Galilee, where sure enough, the disciples are back at their boats and their fishing nets, right where they were the first time Jesus found them. In the words of Rowan Williams, it's as if Jesus had never named them and called them in the first place. It is as if Jesus had never been. As if all memory of him has been erased. The executioners seem to have won. And who wouldn't think that they have, that they do, that the occupiers and colonizers and genociders of history, those with the biggest guns and the largest armies and the best lawyers, and the divinely pronounced and clearly written rites of manifest destiny would succeed. This is the historian's creed, is it not? Follow the money. Follow the power. Jesus is gone. So the disciples went home. Well, some of them did. Verse 10 sees these disciples return home as if it all never was. They believe something, John says. 
Maybe they believe that God took Jesus away to heaven, but that would be to make God complicit with the controlling powers that tried to erase him. The resurrection of Jesus must be about more than the comforting mythology that God took the crucified of history, that God takes the crucified of history to a better place. It's not justice, it's not peace, it's only an excuse. The disciples return home because they believe something, but they do not yet understand. Well, some of them don't. The disciples went home, says verse 10. But Mary begins verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. The sun was surely peeking over the horizon by now, but Mary lingers still in the shadows of her grief. The disappearance of the body of Jesus has only added to her terror and sadness. She lingers because of the memory of her friend and guide. Her grief will not let the memory of his life, the power in his body, be erased. And so it is that there, in the midst of her grief, with tears streaming down her cheeks, that Mary becomes the first person in John's gospel to meet the resurrected Jesus. It is not the one called the beloved disciple whose zeal for Jesus outpaced even Peter in their race to the tomb. It is not Peter whose courage makes him the first one to cross that threshold between life and death and enter the grave where Jesus had been laid. It is neither of these men who claimed pride of place and became the church's earliest and loudest leaders. It is Mary whose tears of anger and sadness, her tears of love and grief and disappointment, tears of fear and rage gave way, give way to the unexpected presence of the risen Christ. This is the lesson in Mary's tears for the church to live up to its calling, our calling as a resurrection people. We will not bypass the loss and the pain of the world. We will, like Mary, linger and weep. We will remember. And wow, do we not know a thing or two about grief. I think of the losses of this last year, the hugs lost in the six-foot chasm between grandparents and grandchildren, the smiles lost behind a mask, the shared spontaneous moments of laughter and tears lost to our collective isolation. For you students, I think of the loss of friends and classrooms of track meets, soccer games, band concerts, theater performances, and dances. And we cannot, we must not forget the loss of precious life. Just on Friday, on Good Friday, three FMCers, Tammy Bousman, Mary Crick, and Kay Massonary, assisted a couple of folks from the UU Church in Urbana with a COVID memorial. For many months now, the UUs have displayed on their lawn over on Green Street in Urbana, an array of red hearts, each heart representing a person from Champaign County who has died from COVID-19. So wanting to share that work of, that sacred work of remembering and also hoping for a little more visible location, the UU Church reached out to FMC to ask if we might want to host the hearts for a time. So now thanks in part to Tammy and Mary and Kay, 138 hearts are planted in the FMC grass at the intersection of Lincoln and Springfield. Some of those hearts have names on them, some of them do not. And we're now also responsible for adding a heart when another life is lost. It's a small thing perhaps, and yet it strikes me this Easter that this kind of remembering is the essence of what it means to be a resurrection people. 
a church who keeps memories alive because of our faith in a resurrection God who identifies with suffering and appears in the midst of the tears. Of course, this has also been a year in which other kinds of pandemics peaked. The pandemic of COVID-19 and the plague of white supremacy, most notably. Last summer's uprisings have been on replay all this week due to the trial of the officer who killed George Floyd. And we hear the memory of Christ's death echo in the trauma of George Floyd's friends and family, in the grief of his mother, in the helplessness of the bystanders called on to testify, who tried to intervene when he was killed. Echoes in so many people of color watching the trial, wondering if our legal system contains enough justice to name Floyd's death as a murder. In a short but very dense book on resurrection, Rowan Williams, who's formerly the Archbishop of Canterbury, makes the case that the resurrection of Jesus is about the memory of God. The resurrection of Jesus brings alive or refuses to forget that God identifies with the victim, the condemned, the criminalized and crucified of history. Memory is so important in Williams's understanding of resurrection because the raising of Jesus is the gospel, the good news of healing. And healing cannot happen apart from attention to the wounds that are being healed. There is no healing of memory, says Williams, until the memory itself is exposed and exposed as a wound, as a loss. If the risen Christ is also the crucified one, then his body remembers forever the pain of being targeted, accused, and tortured. His body is remembered every time a precious life is targeted, accused, and tortured. This is why I think Mary's tears at the tomb, lingering in the shadows, open up to her and to us the possibility of meeting Jesus. She lingers in that grief where God is, where God refuses not to be. The crucified is God's chosen, says Williams. It is with the victim, the condemned, that God identifies, and it is in the company of the victim that God is to be found and nowhere else. To be a resurrection people, then, in this sense, is not so much to read the story of the resurrection as it is to allow the story of resurrection to read us. Why are you weeping? Jesus asks Mary when he appears at the tomb. Whom are you looking for? He says. Whose pain does your life remember? Jesus' resurrection appearance to Mary in the midst of her tears shows us that God's memory, God's memory, holds open the past in a new way. Resurrection holds out hope for forgiveness, for the cycles of violence to ourselves and others to be transformed into something else. God's memory keeping open the past through resurrection overthrows the delusion that our violence is final and irremediable. God's yes is always the final word. Well, when Mary first saw Jesus through her tears, she didn't recognize him. She thought he was the gardener because that's how the human brain works. We only see what we expect to see. And she has very little reason to expect that Jesus would be alive and speaking to her. She saw him on the cross. She took him down from the cross, despite Roman law prohibiting that act. She buried him in the tomb. She is still at this point deeply concerned about a deeply concerning problem. They have taken away my Lord, she says, and I do not know where they have laid him. Where is the body of Christ? This is what concerns Mary at this moment at the tomb. But if it was in the midst of her grief that Jesus first appeared to Mary, 
It's now when he first speaks her name that she finally recognizes him. This recognition of Jesus is a common theme in the post-resurrection stories in the Gospels. People don't seem to know him until something specific elicits a memory. In most of those stories, there's a meal involved. Jesus is breaking bread or serving fish, and it's in that moment that the disciples recognize him. But here with Mary, the memory is prompted by the risen body of Christ calling her name. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around, verse 16, and surely it all came rushing back, those days on the road with him, the power and purpose she found, belonging in the beloved community gathered around Jesus, the hope he had generated among them, hope that a new day was dawning, the sun had finally come up now, hope because, of, because the God of life had truly visited them, eaten with them, and taught them a love that now seemed alive only in their dreams. Yet here was that love, alive in the flesh once more, calling out her name again, hope rekindled. To be a resurrection people is not only to witness to God's presence with the brutalized and criminalized of history, it is not only to choose repentance and embrace the resurrection as the possibility of our own forgiveness and transformation. It is these things. And it is also, and perhaps most simply, to be there for and with each other. The church, this beloved community, is the memory of Jesus alive today. The church is called to be the body of Christ, literally remembered the embodiment of God's love, not exclusively, of course. God's love has many bodies, but certainly essentially. We are not the embodiment of God's love. We are not the church. A resurrection people is simply there for and with each other. It doesn't need to be complicated. The living Christ was embodied when Pastor Deb joined Soren and Tina and David at the emergency room a week ago. The body of Christ was remembered when a small group met in Sam and Megan's backyard last Saturday. The resurrected body of Christ appeared to me over and over and over in the hundreds of cards and notes and prayers you all have sent me and my family and my parents over the past month. The memory of Jesus came alive in that short Maundy Thursday video which if you haven't seen, you need to watch this week. Andrea singing how Jesus took a towel while Mark and Janet wash each other's feet. Andrea singing, yes, he stooped and washed my feet while Laura and Joe wash each other's hands. And Andrea singing, the heavens are the Lord's and the earth is his, while Jonah and Ezra and Levi and David and Rachel all stoop over the water to wash one another's feet. Hey! I thought that's what you wanted. I'm in this is why faith in the Jesus tradition will always be a communal exercise. Faith is unique to each of us as individuals, of course, but it comes alive, faith comes alive in the resurrection community. Resurrection faith is the church's superpower, that mysterious spirit-driven force that can rewire our neurological pretenses Give us new imaginations. Help us see what we don't expect to see, a source of hope that simply cannot and will not originate in ourselves so that we can recognize when God is taking the old script and the dead dreams and writing a new ending where what's dead and buried and hidden under the earth, what's erased from history by those who cannot tolerate difference or equity or humility or judgment or accountability is raised up from the tombs of inevitability and into the realms of new divine and human possibility. Faith is what enables us to see resurrection probabilities at precisely those moments when the sun has not yet come up over the horizon and the shadows still appear to dominate the landscape. Faith is what gives the beloved community the courage to show up just like God in Christ over and over and over in the midst of the scourge of racism or the loss of loved ones or the grief of, life, of isolation or the terror of the unknown 
and to embody that enduring truth of God with us always, always to the end of the age. This same faith is why we look each other in the eyes over Zoom for yet a little while longer and call each other by name. Because in doing this, we echo Jesus. In doing this, we partake of his resurrection power. For as long as there have been followers of Jesus, there have been these feasts of faith. The communion meal that is sometimes called the memorial meal. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus commands. This is why the communion meal is the essential Christian practice. It's the church's embodiment of the crucified and resurrected Jesus. It's when the church becomes the body of Christ. In it, we live out the call of God to be present with and for each other. In the communion meal, we live out the call of God to be present to our own forgiveness that allows us to be present in hope with and for the crucified of history, past and present. Mary recognized Jesus when he called her by name. She was elated, ready to join him again and follow wherever he might lead. But then he does it again, surprises us. He doesn't hang around. Do not cling to me, he said to her. Do not hold on to me, some translations say. Having met Jesus in the midst of her grief, having heard Jesus call out her name, it will not do to linger at the empty tomb any longer. Now we know the light of life still shines in the shadows and the darkness has not overcome it and the living memory of God's love cannot be contained. There is work to do. It is possible after all that not all the graves have been emptied. That all, not all the names of those lingering in grief have been spoken. Have you heard yours called out? Some still wait to hear the true name, their true names called aloud. It is possible that not all the graves have been emptied. You can see it for yourself at the jails and the hospitals in homes where people are trapped in abusive relationships, anywhere the shackles of mental illness and poverty and the cycles of violence and fear have not yet, not yet come undone at the power of a resurrection God worshiped by a resurrection people. Not all the graves have been emptied, but they can be. I have seen the Lord. Mary announced. Amen. May it be so for us in our feasting today. Friends, before us is the joyful feast of the people of God. Many will come from east and west and from north and south and will eat at God's table. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The risen Christ welcomes us to the feast before us. We gather around the resurrection table where all are welcomed and God's good earth is affirmed. From her generosity, we bring these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Witnesses to hope, we participate in Christ's resurrection. Let us pray. Be still and know that I am God. We are still in your presence. You are still with us. In Christ, you accompany us 
embodied among us, sharing our birthing, our living, our dying. Sharing our dreams of hope and liberation, offering us new life and the shattering of the tomb. In Christ, you appear as the host at the ebbing and the flowing of our lives. You beckon us to share your hospitality, your challenge of love. In Christ, you sit as the guest at the table of the stranger. You bless us with your presence, your awakening of love. In Christ, you stand among us as host and guest at the heart of this community. You share with us your vulnerability, your unwrapping of love. As hosts with Christ, we bless the bread. As guests with Christ, we receive the cup. As welcome strangers, united in Christ's life, death, and embodied liberation, we hear the words of promise. This is my body given for you. Take and eat to remember me. This is the cup of the new covenant. Take and drink to remember me. In this action of justice making, we recall broken minds and bodies and blood shed through lust for power in nature's turn of hand. Restore, Restore and, and heal, heal all, all that, that is wounded. wounded. Be present, Be present in the stillness of the waiting. waiting. Roll, Roll back the stone of prejudice and fear. Release the signs of new life. Amen. Amen. You have heard the good news about the two disciples, sad and confused, for they had not yet heard the good news. They were making their way to Emmaus, their home village, while talking with each other about all the things that had happened concerning the arrest and execution of the one they loved. A stranger met them on the road and engaged their conversation. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about God's anointed servants in all the scriptures. They were amazed. It was evening, so the disciples invited the traveler to stay with them when they were at the table together, the stranger took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them. At that instant, their eyes were opened. They recognized him and he vanished from their sight. The disciples said to each other, how our hearts burned within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us. And now we have recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Jesus is here. Gathering in the presence of Christ the Lord, who is our ever-present host, we give thanks for the bread of life. And for the fruit of the vine, that is the cup of salvation. Ordinary things in this world. So that we may be filled, forgiven, healed, blessed, and made new again. This is the welcome table of our Redeemer, and you are invited. Make no excuses saying you cannot attend. Simply come, for around this table, which spans a large geographical region today, you will find your family. Come not because you have to, but because you need to. Come not to prove you are saved, but to seek the courage to follow wherever Christ is. Come not to speak, but to listen. Not to hear what's expected, but to be open to the ways the Spirit moves among you. So give thanks and praise to God, for this is the feast of the love of God. 
where the broken are molded into a beloved community and where the celebration over evil's defeat has already begun. We invite you to turn on your cameras so that we can partake together as a community. Dear friends, you hold in your hands the bread of life, a sure sign that God's love renews this broken body even now. Take and eat. Dear friends, you hold in your hands the cup of the new covenant, a sure sign that God's promise of salvation holds fast even now. Take and drink. May the peace of Christ be with you also with you. God of truth in love, you gave us eyes and we have seen. You gave us hands and we have touched. Christ, our risen Lord and friend, we have dined at your table so that we may be transformed, so that we may grow in faith and in love for you as we meet you in each other. Amen.
Now it's time for sharing, sharing in prayer with one another, and hopefully my uh, microphone will have stopped buzzing at us once in a while too. Um, if you'd Oh God, today we hear Jesus calling our names, our name, beckoning us to be in alignment with your memory, with your hope for the possibility of transforming even the worst into the most abundant declaration of life. May we, like Mary at the tomb, be attentive to our tears, to our fears. We pray that in the midst of faithful remembering, you would show up and would call our names and beckon us to follow you once again. Amen. This is the time for the work of the church. This is a reminder that the uh, foot washing offering is still open. um, And there are the instructions uh, for sending that as a 
form of service in our community. This is a heads up so you know beginning next week uh, after the worship service, adults are invited to remain online um, for a facilitated discussion of the sermon. It will last 30 to 45 minutes. So um, longer than our usual breakout groups, but the, it will be a discussion time. Youth will continue their own um, Sunday school and children will continue what they are doing with the curriculum at home. As Michael mentioned, we now have a COVID display, um, a memorial display out in front of our church. It is really striking and catches your attention. So drive past sometime and notice it. These are uh, one heart for each person in Champaign County who has died from COVID. We are still hoping to have a retreat. So mark your calendars. That will be September 3rd to 5th. Um, no youth Sunday school today, uh, five to seven. Any young adults that are in town are welcome to come to my porch with your masks. Um, whoops. Uh, Wednesday morning, we will be no longer having Zoom chats. It's too nice. We can uh, gather outside uh, at various places. Um, we will have the regular Bible studies um, this Thursday, property and finance meeting. And um, next Sunday, of course, the, the sermon discussion after the worship and the regular youth Sunday school. And I think that's it. We will have breakout groups today. Uh, following the benediction, there will be the hallelujah chorus that Matt Yoder put together last year for us, we will hear. And following the hallelujah chorus then will be the breakout groups for about 10 minutes. That's her hand up. Um, Oh, I have to stop screen sharing. Okay. Okay. I wanted to just remind all of us that uh, April is Earth Month. And later in the uh, month, we'll be celebrating Earth Week. And we ask that uh, you bring or send in photos or drawings showing how you celebrate Earth Week and how you steward through gardening or going to parks or through energy saving devices. So please send those in to Rhonda at, at, at the church by this Friday.
May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Hallelujah, 
Hallelujah.